Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first ever State of Performance. This is one of our this.javascript series where we uh, look at important topics in web development and uh, mobile development and just invite a bunch of experts in to talk about all the cool things that they're doing and all the cool things that are happening. So um, you can see our amazing panel of speakers arrayed below, um, and we will get to them shortly. But first, I'm just going to go through a little bit of administration. So I'm going to pop up some slides here. So as I mentioned, this is the this.javascript um, series of state of performance. So we're going to talk about all the advancements in web performance and mobile performance that have been happening that are going to continue to happen. We're going to go through this with core team members, prominent contributors, and advocates, talk about all the things that are happening, milestones, techniques, cool things you can do to improve performance, and so much more. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors, this.media, who puts on this series and allows us to be able to do this and have these awesome conversations with each other. So thank you so much for them and, and this opportunity to do these, these things that we love doing. And thank you so much to all of our participants on today's panel. Um, we're so glad that you're able to be here. So we have today talking about performance, Minko Getchev, who's an engineer on the Angular team at Google, also a core contributor and creator of Guest.js. So glad to have him here. We also have Joab Weiss, who's a developer advocate at Google and a WebPerf working group member, among so many other things. Um, we'll also have Tatiana Mack joining us. She's an inclusive and accessible designer, an editor for a list apart, and a teacher at Skillshare. Um, we also have Cornell Lazinski, who is a performance engineer at, at Cloudflare. Adi Osmani, who's the uh, engineering manager at Google and just sort of always anywhere where performance is being talked about. We have Patrick Meenan, a web performance engineer at Cloudflare and also, uh, Cloudflare and also a creator of web page tests, so, so glad to have him here. We have Tim Cadlick, a founder of Tim Cadlick Consulting. We have uh, Leonardo uh, Zizamia, who's a senior software engineer at Coinbase and author of Perfume.js. So, so glad he's here. We're also uh, happy to be joined by Harold Kirshner, who's a Firefox product manager at Mozilla, working on developer experience in DevTools and all the really cool things that they've been doing uh, recently and continue to be doing. Uh, my name is Rob Osell. I'm a senior software engineer at This.Labs, and I'm joined by my co-host, Tracy Lee, who is a founder at This. So what are some of the things that we'll be talking about today? Well, we'll be talking about so much. <laughs> but a sample of them is we'll be talking about performance budgets and user-centric metrics, how to get the most from your dev tools, tools like Source Map Explorer, Lighthouse, Guest.js, Perfume.js, and more. Talk about using your frameworks um, correctly and using like your CLI tools to get fast by default configurations. Talk about how to profile your applications at runtime, concepts like differential bundling and optimizing resources, progressive enhancement, and so much more. So you'll want to stay uh, here for the, for the whole series. Some other announcements. Um, we have additional events other than just the this.javascript series. We also have our next Modern Web Online event happening on March 13th at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. The Modern Web Online events are kind of like meetups that are happening on the web. So we get people together. Um, we do some presentations, some talks, and we have some sort of uh, communication, some chat about those topics um, you know, online. So we're kind of taking the meetup concept online, and this will be our first one of that series. Also, our next state of series will be state of testing. That's on April 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, you can find the links here. Uh, invites to these events uh, will be sent out you know, as well. All right. Additionally, we also have our Modern Web podcast series. You can see some of our recent topics. We've been talking about things like GraphQL, AMP, and browser standards. So definitely check that out. We're covering all sorts of amazing topics this year. So you're definitely going to want to keep up with those as well. All right, that being said, we're going to kick things off now. So I will stop sharing, and I will pass things over to Addy so you can get us, get us started. Awesome. Uh, let me get some slides up. Brad, are people able to see my screen? Yep. Awesome. Uh, hey, folks. Um, my name is Adi Osmani. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Google. I lead up a speed team. And uh, as we've got um, myself and Yoav on the call today, uh, I'm going to give you a quick update on our speed tooling efforts. And Yoav is going to talk about instant loading a little bit later on. 
Um, so I love JavaScript, um, but uh, I'm also a big fan of Marie Kondo. So if JavaScript doesn't bring users joy, thank it and throw it away. Um, is something that, that I believe strongly in at the moment. Uh, over the last few years, we've been kind of uh, incrementally improving our understanding of the loading journey for users. So um, loading isn't just a single moment in time. It's generally a number of different phases. And um, more recently, we've been talking a lot about um, the importance of making sure experiences uh, you know, can load and get interactive really quickly. Uh, we recently saw some really interesting research from Akamai uh, where they discovered that um, users expect to be able to interact with experiences um, in about 1.3 times uh, you know, when the page is visually ready. And if for any reason they're unable to interact with those experiences at that moment, um, there's a, a big chance they're going to go and rage click in the experience um, and then potentially leave it. So um, if you are building modern web experiences, do keep these things in mind. Uh, try to optimize for you know, a, a really good time to interactive um, on mobile. So for, for medium mobile devices, we often talk about uh, five seconds being a good target um, over sort of, uh, fa sort of you know, fast 3G, slow 4G. Um, things that you can do to improve your time to interactive are kind of uh, do less work. Uh, and split up your JavaScript, so invest in strategies like code splitting, uh, break up your long tasks. Uh, very recently in the Chrome DevTools, we actually introduced um, the ability to better visualize long tasks uh, in your experiences. And that just helps you drill down and see exactly you know, um, what JavaScript processing was responsible, what scripts are contributing the most to some of those long tasks. Uh, this is available in Canary uh, if folks want to, to try it out. Um, Something uh, else that we've been focused on recently is just uh, continuing to try bringing as, as much insight into our performance tools as possible. So uh, PageSpeed Insights recently got the ability, uh, had, a, had a nice rewrite where um, we now visualize both uh, field data from the Chrome user experience report uh, as well as Lighthouse data. So you have this nice kind of complement of RUM data and synthetic data. Um, and a whole list of opportunities for where you can optimize your performance. Um, in addition to sort of these updates we've made to PageSpeed Insights, um, we've also been uh, heavy at work on uh, web.dev. So web.dev is our new educational portal. Um, it tries to be very data and measurement driven. And the idea is if we discover that there are performance opportunities using Lighthouse um, for you to improve, we'll actually show you a bunch of code labs uh, specific to things we think your site can do better at. So you can learn how to apply a certain optimization um, and do better. Um, tons of great guides on there. Uh, lots of focus on things like JavaScript, um, performance optimization, performance budgeting. Speaking of performance budgeting, so uh, something that I commonly see is engineering teams kind of struggle uh, when they sometimes first take a look at Lighthouse. You know, they don't always have the best scores. Um, and we see a lot of sites where even if people do put in the time and effort to uh, improve their perf, uh, regressions are a thing that commonly happen. Um, and performance budgets can actually help quite a lot with that. Um, the idea with a budget is if you're able to uh, set a, either at like an engineering team level, ideally at an organizational level, what your targets are, you aim to hold the line. So uh, in your CI, in your monitoring tools, anywhere where performance is visualized, you're trying to say, um, we are not going to cross this threshold for our JavaScript, or we're not going to cross this threshold for our, our core speed metrics. And we've seen some good wins from the likes of like Uniqlo and Twitter uh, off the back of investing in performance budgets um, to make sure that their, their teams are not kind of shipping too much code down uh, the wire. Um, I think there's going to be lots of interesting conversations around budgeting this year. Um, a lot of teams that I talk to still struggle with where performance should happen in the overall development lifecycle. Um, it's definitely you know, not just uh, at development and launch. It's something that should be ideally there throughout the whole lifecycle of the project, um, very early on, you know, thought of as part of the proposal and, and the discovery phases of your, um, of your, of your efforts. Um, and we think that more teams should invest in maintaining a performance budget to make sure that any investments in speed um, do kind of have an opportunity to stick around for a longer period of time.
Um, on that note, uh, something we're putting a lot of time and effort into at the moment is a solution currently called Light Wallet. Uh, the idea is that we want to bring first class performance budgeting to tools like Lighthouse. Um, the final UX for this is still very much being um, explored and iterated on right now. But one idea we have is you know, a site or a project defines its uh, performance budgets in a local file of some sort or a hosted file of some sort. And then we're able to read that and highlight exactly where you're regressing um, in different places. So you know, starting off maybe with your local development workflow, maybe at some point uh, in your CI and other places. Uh, at the moment, if uh, teams are interested in exploring a performance budget, we heavily recommend checking out things like bundle size for your JavaScript budget. And if you want to use Lighthouse in CI, uh, we maintain another project called Lighthouse Bot. Um, and this lets you set kind of a threshold for your Lighthouse performance score where you can kind of warn or fail a build if it, if it happens to go over by a certain amount. Um, I've personally enjoyed using Speed Curve. I know we've got kind of Tim and other folks on here that, that use Speed Curve too. Um, I've been enjoying using Speed Curve for setting performance budgets for some of Google's properties. So um, this is one from uh, the keyword, which is the Google blog, so blog.google. And anywhere we're, we're kind of seeing these like uh, high peaks in red uh, is when someone has uploaded an animated GIF to the home page uh, unchecked. So um, these tools do work. They're good for flagging opportunities to do better. Um, and yeah, this 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 also happens. Um, talk to a lot of teams where you know they enforce a budget and then they end up just bumping it constantly. And at that point, you kind of question whether there's still value in the budget. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting conversations around how we help teams navigate. You know, talking to their PMs, talking to their stakeholders about not crossing that budget too much. Um, so yeah, uh, lots of tools that we're, we're currently investing in. Um, we like to think about speed tools uh, in three kind of bu three three buckets really. There's the measure, optimize, and then monitor. So check out some of these tools. Uh, hope they're useful. Um, I had one more very quick thing that I was excited about um, that I wanted to mention. So. Uh, very recently, a couple of months ago, um, I was uh, down by the coast with my wife for our wedding anniversary. And uh, I didn't realize just how bad um, the internet access might be down there. Like we had Wi-Fi pretty much everywhere, but the effective connection types were really, really poor. And although the conversations around, you know, you should be optimizing for 3G, you should be optimizing for low end phones, um, can sometimes feel like you know we're we're harping or or maybe we're talking about it from you know uh, a next billion users perspective. Um, slow performance uh, affects everybody. Uh, I, I ran into the situation where my my internet connection was so slow I couldn't even load up the internet speed test. Like it it failed heavily on that, um, and I could barely load up any of the pages that I normally would go to. Amazon failed. A lot of pages relying on JavaScript failed. And something that helped me quite a lot was some uh, was a new project was as, as a recent project we've been focused on um, where I'm kind of building on top of Chrome's data saver feature. Um, you'll hear more about this uh, sort of in the coming months, but uh, we're looking at a project called Light Pages, and the idea is that there are a lot of built-in optimizations, Google sort of server-based optimizations we can apply when we know that a user's connection speed is really, really poor, so picture 2G effectively, so Wi-Fi you know, at a coffee shop might, might be something that falls into this bucket, but effectively it's focused on making sure that you're able to get some content, even if it's not the entire experience. And um, yeah, this, this effort's called Light Pages, super excited about it, and uh, we hope to talk a little bit more about this in the coming months. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you know, you talked about a lot of different technologies there. Is the thought that all of those will be on web.dev? Like you'll have resources for basically all those tools that you mentioned? Exactly. So our, our goal is to have code labs around any of our speed tools. Um, so it's clear how to use them, where they fit in your workflow and everything. And we're starting to get into a good place with that on web.dev slash fast. Cool. And I, this could kind of go for a lot of people, because a lot of people here have developed tools that people can use to improve performance. But I know one thing that we've heard from people that we've talked to is that they know these tools exist, but they actually aren't sure how to use them. Or even if they know how to use them, they don't know how to use them correctly. So um, are, are people starting to work on, say, uh, you know, like step-by-step -step tutorials, like much more guided experiences for people going through these projects? Is that, is that something that other people have seen on their projects as well? 
I would say that on our side, uh, for sure, we're, we're going to be kicking off a, a round of sort of getting started guides for end-to-end -end applications, but we're going to show you where these different tools fit in at different parts of your workflow. Um, I, I do sometimes worry, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of speed tools that can be overwhelming to try figuring out, you know, what, what goes where, when should you use what. Um, but it's definitely something that we're, we're working on at the moment. Cool. And, and you kind of talked about, the, I think it was light pages at the very end there. And I remember seeing another feature, like the never slow mode feature, I think I've heard discussed as well, like these ideas of users taking control over the performance they will accept as they're browsing. I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to what developers should think about this sort of movement or what they should be aware about. Like, does this make performance even more of an imperative if potentially, you know, their users won't see the site the way they expect it to, because maybe they're saying they only want a certain characteristic of performance? I think so. For light pages specifically, we're going to make sure that it's possible for developers to use things like the newer reporting API to understand if light pages are being taught, like triggered for their users. Um, in general, I think that you know we we do strongly emphasize using the speed tools that are available to understand if there are opportunities to do better. Um, I do think there's a lot more we could be doing for folks who are on like the worst connections. Um, there, you know, we've had APIs like NetInfo, Effective Type. We've had client hints. Uh, you know, there are folks on this call who've been very gracious in, in helping move these things forward over the years. I'd love to see more use of those types of capabilities to ship lighter experiences down to users. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Addy, for your presentation um, and for sharing that with us. It's really awesome to hear what you guys are working on. And uh, with that, I think we'll move on to our next presentation. We're really happy to have Harold Kirshner here, who's, again, a Firefox product manager working on developer experience, dev tools. And honestly, if you've been following um, him or any of his team or anybody that uses Firefox on Twitter, you've seen the amazing work and the advancements that they've been making in the last, uh, you know, well, for a long time, really. But, but definitely it's being appreciated. So uh, with that, Harold, you know, why don't you uh, take us away? The screen share and starting my five minute timer. <laughs> I'm <gonna laughs> talk forever. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah, Rob, we're gonna give a great introduction. Nothing more, more to say. So, of course, there you go. yeah, with with having presentation on Firefox, I should also go through obligatory like things we're shipping that make things faster for developers and, and users. So it's a, the themes are a lot around the same th things that the browsers have, creating more fast paths for developers so they can just work away and uh, get performance for free, but also creating, uh, putting existing code on the fast path by either interventions or just making uh, things better in the browser. So looking back at 65, two examples would be WebP and AV1, both new compression algorithms that really make it easier to ship media on the web to more users because you just ship less data for this same amount of video. And just a trend on the web, that there's more and more video, more and more high resumes images, HDR, other concept that, that need great compression. And also the uh, that you can actually use the codec without paying a lot. Then also 67, so if web render coming uh, for Windows 10 and NVIDIA. So web render, um, Hopefully everybody saw the announcements. It's really removing a lot of the bottlenecks and performance cliffs on the web with layer management and will change. Basically, things like will change, where you say that an element should be a layer, basically doesn't mean anything in WebRunner because everything will be just so fast. It's, it doesn't even uh, care about it. And then we're looking at some scheduling improvements. And that's something Chrome, Firefox, and other browsers have been constantly looking at. How can we tweak the internals of the browser to render pages faster? And in this case, we, we load the priority for set timeout and set interval, some things developers shouldn't trust in the, this age anyways, because background pages can throttle them in other cases. And we saw some 30% improvements on some pages. So it's really interesting how the accumulation of JavaScript, as Eddie mentioned, just leads to so much scheduling conflict where everything tries to schedule and they fall back from promises to set timeouts. So it's just a whole lot of mess that's trying to uh, basically take over the main thread. And it's interesting how these small tweaks can help there. But a main, main talk, and I wanted to go more into that. So there's five things I wanted to share from the Firefox and DevTools team on what how you can treat performance. To give some background on Firefox DevTools, it is just a web app. Uh, it's a server client architecture, it's written in JavaScript, React Redux. It can run out of Firefox partially. And we have an amazing community thanks to that because you can just code in web technology. And you can check out Firefox DevTools if you want to 
start looking into that. And we had some recent performance work to improving panel load times and responsiveness with a set of things that is accessible to most devs, like just looking at um, the, the places you can improve and just keep profiling. So start one, uh, start by committing. If you want to treat performance as a feature, you have to get requirements, user stories, resourcing, testing structure, success criteria, user research, a big implementation, the whole thing, everything you do to ship a feature, you also want to start committing when you work on performance. The measure throughout the development cycle. So you want to, and that's a lot around, if you look at DevTools and Firefox, we have the Firefox profiler, we can measure locally. We have a regression test suite, Chrome as well. And there's Firefox Cemetery where we can get data from the wild. And through that process, we can verify a fix locally, verify it in the build system, but also then verify it in the wild. And you want to have that end-to-end -end understanding in place before you start optimizing things where you might not be sure about. And it's really about landing the metrics. I mean, there's a big push for just generic metrics like TTI and meaningful paint, where it tries to guess when the page is ready. But new, you, you know your users. You know if you're Pinterest that people want to see the pin. If you're Twitter, people want to see tweets. And that, that's kind of how you have to drive your metrics, that you really can explain them, that you can easily measure them, that they're part of the user experience, and they're consistently measured, not just locally in automation, but also the real world. Uh, expose them. Validate them, plan in the time is something we have done, and then continuously monitor. Um, that's something where we have to hold the line, as I mentioned. Like there's a, a set budgets and sort of things. And of course, uh, channeling my inner Alex Russell, measuring on all load devices. Going to cross functional. So with Firefox on the flow, if you followed along, we had a very cross functional team set up that triaged, analyzed, and found the right owners. That's something we also saw in DevTools, that it has been a cross-functional meeting, and then people came together and really uh, across the application stack and brought in knowledge from across the browser stack as well. Because it just it's really hard to work on performance, because they have to know browser internals around scheduling and service workers and caching. And usually, like not one person is that person. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that person that knows all of the browser stack and all of the application stack. You need this mix. And then, yeah, it's 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 never ending. You have to iterate continuously. And that's something, um, it's a theme where we want to have a backlog continuously of performance issues and be the data-driven meaningful to prioritize it, similar to code quality and polish, how some people treat it. We want to make sure that continuously we can actually work on performance. And improving performance perceptible, that you actually see, wow, this page is faster, is really hard. Often you have a release where you push a number 5% or 10%. But it's it's also a worthwhile goal to not regress performance. So it's as important to set the targets and actually hold them. And the last tip, so pull everybody in. So we saw with Quantum, we had we nurtured this culture of performance, and we still keep doing it. We want to grow on contributors. People are comfortable to report performance issues. We have office hours. We share our newsletters, quantum newsletters. We even post them on blogs. Like, here's the things that landed. Here's how to improve things. Here's what we learned. So it's really important to build that understanding across the engineering org and even beyond how you effectively can work on performance. And one of the tricks we had in our sleeves that we developed doing quantum really as a, as a core strength is the collaborative analysis with Firefox Profiler, something we wanted to share here. So it really allows us to, to have this workflow of Everybody can record a performance profile without going into dev tools or some tool that they don't feel comfortable with. Just record it. They, if, if you feel comfortable in the tool, then you can also explore it and select the parts that are most interesting. When you have something that you find interesting and want to share, like, hey, like, is this something you you would expect in this kind of page? Then you can take that snapshot and share it as a short URL. And somebody can open that same URL and open it up and see the same view and kind of select something else and say, no, but this is interesting. and that, and they can bounce it back. So we get into this documenting a performance analysis by linking to different views, just using the web. So really like bringing the tool to the web allows that the linking, allows that, that short URL piece, uh, makes it a lot easier for everybody. So that's um, the, the, some links there if we want to try it out. And that's something we're hopefully exposing to more people to make that uh, part of the flows. And that's it. I it was a little more than five minutes, but um, hopefully I can have some questions. Very cool. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, 
One of my questions, sort of on the one of the last things you showed there, the the profilers, like the flame graphs. We've talked to people, and they just love those graphs. They're like, I, that was how I got so much performance for my team was digging into those. But I know other people that see them, and their eyes immediately go cross. Like, is there any work or thought going on about like maybe how to make those sort of profiling, um, the flame graphs and things like that, a little bit easier to consume? Totally. I think that's that's something we're working on right now. So the UI right now is, in a lot of cases, built for Firefox engineers. And even within Firefox, there's some people who really can dig into it and take it apart. But if you look at there, there's a we have actually have a weekly meeting, Joy of Profiling, where one or two or three people like dig into profiles and kind of just click around and try to understand stuff, where people can they have a core performance issue, can kind of share it out and look at it. And Etch mentioned something similar in the past where they had a core performance group that met up and looked at profiles because it's it's really hard as somebody who's not doesn't know the whole stack to really understand what's going on especially if you look at like some JavaScript module that you don't even own or you look at react and some internals there so you might have to look at your one person in the company that really knows how react rendering works and it's most cases if you work on a web you don't want to know how your library internals work but if you look at a profile a lot of that get, gets exposed. So I think like something like Lighthouse, where it just has heuristics based on network patterns, and a lot of the the, the, the definitions there come from just critical path analysis, where like uh, if you like load this font earlier, something will render earlier, and that's that's something where a lot of the current work is happening. It's also where most teams should spend their time, just uh, reducing page weight and changing how network resources are loaded. So this tool is really like more, more the end goal, eventually, when you hit a point where it's about responsiveness in a page, like in a single page web app, navigating between pages, like why is my animation slow? Why does this menu open in, in a weird way? So it, it's, a, it's a lot around that. But then the collaboration piece make this, makes this a lot easier. Like you might be not the person to look at it, but as long as you're comfortable recording a performance issue and then sharing it out, it still empowers you. And we saw as once we have told people how they can record performance issue, they they won't stop. It's just it's so easy. Like once you see a performance issue, like oh I, I sh should report this. So that that's that's something where um, it just unlocks a big much larger group to help reporting, and then the smaller group who actually know to look at profiles, they can then help out. Great. And those meetings that you talked about, those groups, are those public things? Are those things that are happening right now that, that people could pay attention to? Or Yeah, the drive profiling, I tried to find a good link to link to. Uh, I'll uh, look it up and post it in the chat. So there's some some sessions. Basically, it's on air.mozilla.com. That's that's our public video channel. And I'll, I'll post links there. Um, it's it's an hour long of people just looking at profiles. So if you're into that, um, then it's really cool. I, I, I am, <laughs> but also because they're <laughs> using the product I'm, I'm working on. So um, yeah, it's, it's something I'm, I think we're going to be more open about. And I'm, I'll probably also put this presentation in a blog post with more links. Great. Uh, Leo, did you say question. you had a question? Yeah, I have a question about, um, I'm very curious about the um, the state of performance observer in Firefox, mostly because um, learning that set them out and set it, mostly set them out to get related um, in Firefox, that means um, that was one of the solution I was adopting for uh, measuring a uh, first paint in Firefox because uh, for, uh, performance observer doesn't used to not support uh, first paint in Firefox. So my question is, uh, is this supporting first paint now? Yes or no? And maybe when? So we have the paint timing APIs behind preference right now. We're trying to we're trying them out right now. So they're, they're a little undefined right now. Only Chrome ships them. So we, we're currently second mover. We we're trying them out on our internal testing tooling right now. See if they work correctly. If they are constant and validate them against profiles. So I think they're already reported in the profile actually. But um, if you want, want to try it out, um, they're in nightly behind press now. But okay. so at some point, they should also be shipping. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Harold. That was that was a really great presentation. And honestly, for those of us that are kind of nerds at going through profiling, that's actually a really great resource of something to check out. So uh, next up, we have. Um, Leonardo Zizamia, who's a senior software engineer at Coinbase and author of Perfume.js. So 
uh, you asked a question and now you get to do your presentation. So when you're ready, feel free to jump right in. Okay. Um, first of all, um, hi everyone. Um, I'm uh, recording, I'm live here from San Francisco from the Coinbase office. I recently joined Coinbase um, in October as a senior software engineer and one of my focus uh, is definitely improving performance and uh, uh, monitoring the performance of the website. We are a startup, and as a startup, we definitely have a lot of improvement, uh, uh, space of improvement, and definitely we are starting on uh, monitoring. Uh, I worked on uh, the last year uh, before before joining Coinbase. Uh, on my free time, I was focusing more and more on the performance observer uh, API that you, everyone can already use on uh, Chrome, which give you the opportunity to uh, monitor on every website, on every web page in the world, first paint and first contentful paint. And uh, as soon as I joined Coinbase, I uh, start to using tools like uh, Lighthouse and all the tools that Hadi already mentioned. But specifically, uh, because a startup like Coinbase is interested to a broader audience across different country, monitoring performance uh, for every country we support and also country that we not support, it's important to understand if we are really performant for first paint and first meaningful paint uh, across all this experience. So I'm going to share uh, quickly. Uh, let's see, uh, share the screen. So I'm going to give you like a quick overview. So this is a library, an open source library that I wrote over a year ago. It's called Perfume.js. It's just some uh, sugar code on top of the Performance Observer um, API and on top of some polyfill to enable to measure not only first contentful paint, but also first input delay. Uh, to go very quickly, uh, the overview is pretty simple. You download the perfume and you can just like instantiate uh, a new instance of the object and by say, I want to observe first paint or I want to observe first contentful paint. And uh, you can also, uh, it's uh, also used on top of the performance uh, object. So you can mark a specific uh, point in time from that you are interested and in figuring out uh, which one is like your metrics, um, not only on your development mode, but also in real in uh, real time. Like with React, another library, another framework, you can uh, you can see your components, the lifespan of the components already um, in your dev tools. What Perfume is giving you is the opportunity to record the same or similar metrics with a, uh, with a real user across different countries, uh, different devices, different network connectivity. And uh, you can also Perfume give you some uh, quick and uh, like uh, sh uh, synthetic sugar to starting to uh, a specific point in time and ending to the next uh, uh, set time out, so, so to the next paint. Um, two, I mean, there are some Angular, um, Angular feature, the uh, Angular way to do it, uh, some React, but it's pretty simple. Automatically, the library uh, uploads all the information to Google Analytics if you want. Or, for example, in uh, Coinbase, we have our own analytics, and we just like use uh, we just use the analytics tracker um, callback to just say when you have this information, just send it to my uh, tracker. That can be any uh, any analytics tool you're using in your company. Um, I want to just continue by showing some of the uh, early. So we started using Perfume in production in Coinbase in January. And we already start seeing some interesting uh, metrics that we are integrating uh, in different teams. So different teams now use uh, first paint and uh, this one. First contentful paint as a kind of like a North Star to figure it out if we are doing uh, uh, well our job in different countries. At the bottom, you can see uh, like the blue line is uh, uh, US. So on the bottom, all the kind of like two seconds, 2.5, three seconds, these are Western countries. So we'll talk about uh, United States, um, Italy, France, um, uh, United Kingdom, Australia. And um, instead, the red one is a country that we don't support yet, like India, or the top one with almost six seconds is uh, Nigeria. It's very interesting to see how the performance can change, even if Lighthouse 
uh, kind of like give you the, uh, for example, with the lighthouse, our metric was like first paint was 1.6 seconds. We were like, okay, we are doing a great job. But the reality is you still have to double check this result in all the countries your uh, your application um, uh, is supported or is not supported yet. And here you can see the difference between first contentful paint as a desktop uh, devices and uh, as a mobile. So the interesting thing is, um, yeah, for example, Australia, that is the uh, little blue one, this one, uh, on, on desktop, it's uh, quite the same speed of the other like Western country, but on mobile, it's drastically different. It's get way slower. So this is interesting how Australia, they might have like a really good Wi-Fi, but as soon you get kind of like in a rural, rural area and like a phone connection, it's just like the quality decreases drastically. So these are things that I discovered that I didn't know by just like watching these metrics. So we don't only, we don't only measure first contentful paint, we also measure first input delay. And uh, this uh, gets, um, uh, we are not quite using this metric yet, but we start monitoring to uh, see over time how this metric can be useful for us. One new, one new metric that uh, is actually interesting for us is how we approach uh, first uh, meaningful paint. So we're going to hear probably from other members of this uh, Hangout how first paint, the first, min first meaningful paint works. But to, keep, to give like a quick uh, overview, first paint is when you see the first bit of content. And that's we're already measuring with this metric. But we need to measure, uh, for example, Coinbase, you see the header very quickly, but still takes time to load all the information for give me uh, information about the Ethereum, the latest price, the latest uh, uh, asset information. And that is what it, for us is the first meaningful paint. So we start using, um, so first contentful paint, that's how um, it's, uh, for example, around 1.5, 1.6 seconds. And we have like this asset page. The asset page is, it just a in this case, it's just a React component. It can be a React component, an Angular component, doesn't matter. What matters is you start measuring from the constructor to the component uh, paint the, um, gets all the, all the, the, the the component gets all the information from the API and finally pan, paints all the information to the user. And we realize that this measure component, that they usually are page component, um, that is very close to our first meaningful paint. So these measurements are not uh, exact, they are not precise on a millisecond, but it's good enough for us to understand if we measure asset page pine, asset pages paint over time, and we reduce this timing in the future, this is going to be a, a good um, uh, kind of like North Star metric to, um, to for the health of our application, for the health of Coinbase. And uh, here we started literally just measuring like a few weeks ago. So you can see asset page component on desktop and on mobile, where on desktop gets from 2.3 seconds from US and uh, uh, to uh, other country like Australia can get the email for four seconds and same for mobile um, and yeah I want to just conclude by saying um, real usual metrics is definitely not a solution for everything is complement uh, part of the work that everyone of course needs to do with the lighthouse uh, all the web tools and uh, every um, every tooling that in the end people like cares and enjoy to use and in the end, with this open API, so perfume in the end is just like some sugar code, but eventually perfume is going to disappear, and uh, performance observer is going to be just good at the the object. Uh, performance observer is just going to be good enough for your metrics. For now, perfume is just make sure that to remove some noise, uh, making sure that if you uh, to record only the metrics that are important. For example, if you are on your in your tab and. Uh, uh, you're loading the page, but you change tab. Perfume knows to just drop the drop the recording because that metric can be uh, polluted very quick, very easily if uh, you are coming back to the same tab, and the 
and the and the metric stop measuring only like 30 minutes later when uh, you are coming back to the same tab. So my point is, this library uh, is very useful for now, uh, and we are using it in Coinbase. But I'm looking forward uh, to the web standard committee to imp and the browsers like Firefox and Chrome to improve the effort for uh, the uh, vanilla JavaScript APIs. Thank Great. You. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation and for sharing that. Um, I had a question, just one question based on the, the, the statistics that you showed us, kind of settled on the sort of the average case it looked like, um, so like the 50th percentile and you were breaking it down by country. Um, you know, some people kind of wonder which way they want to break down their metrics. Is there any magic to the way that you did it? Have you found that a very effective way? Or is that just something that's unique to you? Or how should people decide which percentile or maybe how to split up their users when they're tracking that? I, um, first of all, I, I use Google Analytics. So Google Analytics, I went to the, uh, the devices, the top 15, the top 20. So we use Amplitude as a software to uh, track all the, uh, our metrics. And through using this, uh, this software, I, I said desktop are all these devices. And mobile are all these sort of like devices. So I went to Google Analytics and I took the top 15, the top 20 devices for desktop and for mobile. And I just manually uh, added to uh, our internal tooling um, metric system. And that was the first kind of like uh, way to organize the metric. What is, what, what is desktop and what is mobile? Focus for what is important for Coinbase. Uh, I think that is very important to just like focus on what is important for you and what is important for your company. And also we did the same for uh, countries. We went, which one are the top 20 countries that um, the people are visiting, uh, that we support, and the countries that we don't support yet. So um, it would be very easily to just show like where we are doing very well. But I think the conversation is more, really more interesting in places like Africa or Asia, or even on the big sewer at this point, <laughs> and just like uh, see how we're doing uh, poorly in some location in the world. Uh, for now, it's just like country basis, but who knows? Maybe we can uh, uh, get information uh, more precisely city by city eventually. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it was really interesting and uh, you know, another great tool for us to try out and experiment with. All right, next up, we have uh, Minko Getchev, an engineer on the Angular team at Google, and also a core contributor and creator of Guest.js. So Minko, why don't you uh, take it away whenever you're ready? Hey, yeah, sure. Let me just share my screen. All right, we're up. Perfect. So first, uh, why performance is important and why developers should care about this. Obviously, uh, we, are, we started shipping bigger and bigger applications recently over the network. And uh, the user, they just have to wait in order to get some experience. Uh, and this is quite annoying. So it turns out that about 77% of the mobile website, they take more than 10 seconds to load over a 3G network. And 19 seconds is the average load time uh, of an application over a 3G network. In the same time, we should consider the emerging markets where the network speed is slower and we still need to be able to provide accessible and uh, reliable uh, applications there as well. So uh, Adi also shared this interesting diagram where he shown that also uh, waiting for a slow web application to load is quite stressful. So we don't want to, sh to stress out our users for sure. In order to reduce the number of bytes that a number of uh, bytes of JavaScript that we're sending over the network, because it, this is the most expensive asset recently with uh, the advancements of the web platform, we started uh, introducing more and more code splitting on finer level of granularity. In Google, we have been doing this for a while now with different internal tools. But um, this is getting more and more popular practice uh, outside of Google as well. We have lazy loading, and with lazy loading, Another practice is uh, prefetching in order to speed up the subsequent user navigations. This, is, uh, this was one of our main goals with GetJS, actually. So 
another uh, practice that is emerging recently in order to reduce the size of the JavaScript bundles that we're transferring over the wire is differential loading. This allows us to build different versions of our application, of our bundles, and ship them depending on the browser that the user is actually using. So this way, for older browsers, we can ship ECMAScript 5 bundles. And for newer browsers, which support new JavaScript syntax, we can ship smaller bundles, reduce the number of polyfills, and uh, provide source code with, which can be executed faster as well. Another practice that I can, another technique that I can see recently for speeding up web applications is introducing compilers in the framework. Of course, we have this in Angular. We are rebuilding our compiler Ivy right now, which aims to fix, uh, to um, generate very fast instructions to render the views of the components. And this way we can take advantage of very low level optimizations of the JavaScript virtual machine. For example, we can generate more monomorphic source code, which executes faster in the browser. This is uh, not only in Angular. This uh, happens in other frameworks as well. This is a common practice in Cell, for example, and also Glimmer, um, where they're even shipping their own virtual machine together with the generated source code. So server-side rendering has been a technique that we have been using for a while now. But so far, we didn't have progressive rehydration of the views. This is one of our uh, main focuses in the Angular team for uh, 2019 and 2020, where we would want to let developers use server-side rendering uh, by default and right after that allow them to uh, let the framework rehydrate the view without destroying everything which has been rendered on the server. So we want to enable this by default. And in the CLI, we have been trying to do that for a while now. We have, uh, we have enabled, for example, uh, progressive web application support with the Angular service worker. We have performance budgeting in the Angular CLI and uh, different bundle optimizers, which lets us perform Angular-specific optimizations. So in, as part of version 8, we're working on a few new features. We want to enable differential loading of polyfills and bundles by default. So when users build their Angular application with Angular CLI, we want to actually make two builds, one with ECMAScript 5 bundles and one with ECMAScript 2015 bundles, so that users who are using newer browsers can get the smaller and the faster version of the application by default. Of course, we also want to enable more aggressive code splitting because, well, it doesn't matter how small bundles are getting. At some point, the complexity of the application and the number of features that we would want to introduce, it grows even faster. So we should split the application on smaller units. So this, is effort, this effort for more aggressive code splitting is going in two different uh, branches in, in Angular right now. One of them is to enable users to generate lazy loaded routes by default in the CLI. So this is one of the features that we want to ship in version 8. And I, in Ivy, we would want to enable very convenient cold level, uh, excuse me, component level code splitting. We already have some effort from the community, which allows developers to implement code splitting on component level with Angular. But we would want to make it even more convenient. So this is going to be our main focus for version 9. Of course, together with code splitting, we would need to introduce different, a prefetching strategy, preloading strategy, or prefetching strategy, depending on the terminology and what we would actually want to achieve. So uh, here are a few libraries which can allow you to do that. One of them is effort uh, is a create uh, Chrome created quick link. Together with Chrome, we worked on guess.js, which allows you to perform predictive prefetching. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're using Angular or React or any other framework. And also, Quick Link implementation for Angular is another thing that you can use. Uh, for example, with Quick Link, the framework, actually the library, uh, Quick Link, is going to download, is going to prefetch all the JavaScript bundles associated with links which are currently visible on the page. This, can, this uses internally intersection observers and can speed up the subsequent page navigation experience a lot. And finally, in Angular, we want to enable developers to ship 
fast applications from end to end. So we are working on NG Deploy, collaborating with Firebase, with Azure, and with Zite in order to enable compression and uh, CDN for static applications by default. This is something that we hope we'll be able to ship in the version 8 release. And yeah, that was the update for me. Love to get your questions. Great. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. You know, one of my questions is with the guest.js um, and it running off of analytics, and to some degree, this kind of goes with Perfume.js too, but um, you know, what should people be doing now, maybe even before they are looking into integrating these tools, to accumulate the amount of data that will make these tools most effective? Is there anything that you suggest about the way that people should track analytics or track users by particular um, metrics that are that are most effective for, for driving some of this um, intelligent code splitting? Yeah, specifically for GetJS, we didn't want to, as developers, we, we, would want, we wanted to reuse uh, the information that developers already have. So there is nothing specific that they should uh, do. Uh, the, only, uh, the only constraint, I guess, is that we should be able to map the individual pages from Google Analytics to JavaScript bundles. And for very dynamic routing, this might not be possible. So that's why we are targeting applications uh, which are written with Gatsby or uh, with Angular or with Next.js, where the routing can be more like statically resolved. Great. And you know, it's interesting because I think there was a period where a lot of frameworks and a lot of libraries were trying to go in for pure configurability, right? They just wanted to give people all the levers that they needed. And um, my question is, I'm starting to see libraries like things, things that you're presenting with Angular. We've, we've talked to the AMP team a lot, and they have a similar ethos of just trying to make things fast by default. I'm kind of curious how you guys see the balance between giving developers like power and flexibility versus you know, just making the general development case the most performant, the most accessible, the most secure that it can be. Like, how do you guys kind of manage that? Yeah, for sure, we'll want to provide a very configurable CLI, but in the same time, enable best practices by default. So uh, we know when it is most efficient to, for engineers to use code splitting, which is most of the time. And we would want to integrate this as a core feature in the CLI. We would want to provide a core uh, generator, which generates automatically laser loaded routes. And as part of the CLI, eventually, as well, uh, provide a preloading strategy. In Angular, that's how we we call the route in preloading because we are using slightly different techniques than the link prefetch uh, mechanism in Chrome. Uh, so, I can, yeah, I see it this way: providing a very powerful, configurable tool, but in the same time, making sure that we have enabled best practices by default. Hey, Minko, I have a question for you about um, intersection observer. Um, I'm very curious, what's your opinion, or mostly what's your own experience on uh, uh, using it in a Safari where you're obligated to have a polyfill because intersection observer, how good is the polyfill? Because I'm reading about it and I have a like, uh, missed feeling. Uh, what's your own experience with it? So specifically for the Angular port of the quick link strategy, I prefer to not use polyfill if uh, possible. So, uh, they, because I don't want to in introduce another like 10K or so. So the strategy that we're using for the Angular Quick Link Prefetch Preloading strategy is just to download, just to prefetch all the different bundles which have links on the current page. Uh, I guess maybe Adi has a better, uh, maybe, uh, because from what I know, like, um, Quick link uses intersection observers by default and requires a polyfill. So probably. Yeah, in quick link, we're currently relying on people dropping in a polyfill for intersection observer. But my understanding is that Safari Tech Preview does have an implementation of intersection observer available. And so hopefully the Apple gods will bless us with an implementation that should be stable sometime soon. Uh, yeah, just one addition for both quick link and ng quick link. NGX Quick Link. It's, uh, so in uh, NGX Quick Link, we are not preloading if the user is on a very slow network. Uh, we want to make sure that they have good data, and we don't want to drain their connection. 
always always a good call. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minko, for for sharing that. That's uh, that was really useful information. All right, next up we have uh, Cornell Lazinski, who's a performance engineer at Cloudflare. So whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Hello. Uh, so um, Minko briefly shown a slide. Uh, that a, a megabyte of JavaScript is not the same as a megabyte of a JPEG. Uh, obviously, your JavaScript can do much more, costs the browser uh, to process much more for every, every bit of your JavaScript. Uh, but even if you uh, avoid uh, fat libraries, optimize everything, code split your JavaScript, uh, you might have a surprise, because on the network level, uh, megabyte of JavaScript uh, is as costly as a megabyte of your images. And I wanted to point uh, to nice analysis by Paul Calvano uh, based on HTTP archive data, uh, where he correlated various uh, speed metrics uh, with uh, rough characteristics of uh, pages. And what stands out is that image weight uh, has a higher correlation with overall page speed uh, than just a uh, rough uh, JavaScript weight. So um, you have to also remember uh, to optimize your images. Uh, HTTP2 will not save you. Uh, at Cloudflare, uh, we've been looking at it, uh, and Patrick Meenan will probably tell you more about it. Uh, but when you use HTTP2, you have uh, mostly a single TCP IP connection uh, between a uh, browser and the server. And what gets downloaded in what order um, is negotiated in the protocol. And uh, how ac it actually works depends very much on the quality of implementation of the browser and the server. Um, and we've seen cases where um, it doesn't work that well, where you might have a huge image sent to the browser as one big chunk blocking everything else um, and delaying uh, other resources on the page. Uh, so at Cloudflare, as a CDN, uh, we're working on fixing that on the protocol level, on the network level uh, for you. Uh, but it won't hurt uh, if you. Uh, also remember to optimize images. Uh, on your origin, you'll probably have a bunch of PNGs which can get very large very quickly, uh, lots of JPEGs. So uh, the easy and best tools for this are PNG quant, uh, which will compress your PNGs, uh, even make them three times smaller, and most JPEG, which is uh, the best codec you can get for JPEGs today. And I also want to point out it's very important to automate this. Uh, because even if you jump uh, now and optimize all your images, you'll probably move to another project. You'll focus on something else. And your page might regress. So um, I recommend uh, looking into uh, tools or services uh, that will automatically handle this for you. Uh, at Cloudflare, we have a service for this. Uh, there's Cloudinary service that optimizes images very well. Um, there's Image Optim uh, tool and an API that cannot do it for you. Or if you would rather self-host, uh, there are tools like uh, Thumbbore or ImageFlow, uh, which are can be your own image servers uh, that will automatically resize and optimize images, uh, every, any image you can serve from your server. Uh, so uh, that's the that's the unexpected. Even if you optimize your JavaScript and forget about images, the images may ruin your JavaScript for you. So keep up. <laughs> that's a very scary thought. Um, <laughs> but you know, I I think it's something that's underappreciated for sure. Um, how much you can get out of these images. I know when I played around with the, the, the Squoosh app, or however we pronounce that, mm -hmm. I was surprised how far things could, could condense. Um, you know, 
these automated tools, I think, are a really good idea. Um, they get the same kind of performance and are pretty easy to integrate with people's build build steps and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you have to keep in mind that uh, usually you, as a developer, you're not actually responsible for the content on on your site. So uh, if you have some kind of a CMS. Um, Someone managing your CMS might just upload a, a photo straight from a digital camera, and then you'll have a 20 meg image right on your home page. Uh, that just cannot be fast. No matter what else you optimize, it's going to block your entire connection um, and make everything slow. So you, have, you have to have tools, uh, processes, some sort of automation to um, at least prevent those uh, most terrible cases. Um, do these tools that you mentioned, uh, do these also do like conversion of uh, like animated GIFs to movie formats as well? Is that, or? Oh, this, one, this one is tough uh, because uh, of course you should. GIF uh, is absolutely terrible at compressing. It's so inefficient. Um, by con you can convert GIFs to uh, a modern codec um, and get the file size 10 times smaller for visually the same quality, or even better. Um, so the savings by of, of converting GIFs to video are huge. Um, the downside is you need different markup. You need to have actual video markup. Um, you need to uh, worry about uh, proper codec support. Um, you need to add extra attributes, uh, like uh, place inline and muted uh, to allow browsers uh, to autoplay your video uh, without uh, requiring user interaction. So uh, this is a bit of code. Um, you might also want to use Intersection Observer to start playing only videos that are actually on screen. Um, uh, so it's a it's a bit of scripting scripting job that that needs to be done. Uh, fortunately, um, it's getting better. The Safari supports uh, MP4 uh, videos embedded in regular image tag. So uh, if you know you can if you can detect Safari, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think you can do that uh, in a in a nicer way um, declaratively. But uh, for Safari, you can you can just serve. Uh, MP4 as is, uh, and it'll play it nicely. For uh, many other browsers, you could use animated WebP, but animated WebP tries to be also a simplistic format similar to GIF. So animated WebP is not much better than, than GIF. Uh, if you can use actual uh, video uh, codec, that is so much better. Uh, and um, AV1 for uh, codec uh, is becoming available in browsers, which is another halving of your bandwidth, uh, if you can use that. Great. And I'm, there's another thing that I've heard people talk about. I don't know if, if you, know, you have experience with it or if these tools can handle it, but it's the use of like source set to set multiple different images at different resolutions so people don't have to get the biggest image that would show up on a desktop if they're using their mobile device. Is that uh, something that any of these tools that you mentioned help people with, or is that something that people should definitely be looking into? Is that is that like a high impact change that they can make? Uh, this is a very high impact change. Um, there is no single image size that is uh, good for uh, all of your clients. Uh, and uh, you'll have visitors with uh, desktops with 4K displays where you will probably like to give them a nice big image in super sharp resolution. Uh, but you cannot serve the same image uh, to someone browsing on a slow connection on a, a tiny screen. So using source set, uh, source set and sizes uh, attributes on image is absolutely a great way to do that. Um, that requires changes in markup. So if you're con in control of your CMS, in control of your components embedding images, uh, you should put it there. Uh, if not, um, there's uh, also reasonably good fallback uh, client hints. Client hints uh, does not require any changes to your markup. It works on the network level. Uh, you opt in with a meta tag, but then you get HTTP headers uh, sent to your server with information about uh, screen size, uh, uh, screen density um, that the image is uh, for. Uh, and you can script it then server-side uh, 
on uh, we're, we're gonna add uh, better support for this at Cloudflare. We have a thing called uh, Edge Workers where you can run JavaScript on every request, uh, not on your server, but on our uh, Edge network. So it's a low latency uh, way to uh, operate on files as they're read from the cache. So this way, um, you'll be able to uh, very easily read uh, client hints from the browser and select uh, image uh, to serve just in time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all that presentations about images. I think, you know, like you said, it's it's definitely something that people should be looking at. It's powerful, um, and and probably maybe a little under discussed at the moment. Yeah, so that's... I, I would expect, you know, uh, everyone blames JavaScript for being the slowest <laughs> thing, uh, but we have data showing large image requests uh, have uh, the highest correlation. Great. Well, thank. That's that fault. Well, thank you so much. All right. Coming up next, we have um, Tim Cadlick, who's a founder at Tim Cadlick Consulting. So Tim, whenever you're ready, feel free, take it away. Cool, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, great. All right, um, let me share the screen then. All right, does everybody see, hopefully, a slide on their display? Yep. Awesome. All right, so uh, Addy set me up really nice. So thanks for that, Addy. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to talk about performance budgets, but specifically performance budgets that stick. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations sometimes that I hear just on Twitter chat or elsewhere, you know, about folks saying, well, how, can a performance budget really be useful? Can it really help? Um, and it can. It just, you have to take a few uh, extra steps and make sure it's not in isolation. Um, so first off, if you hadn't heard the term before, you know, Addy uh, mentioned it earlier, just to sort of reiterate, the way I define a performance budget is a clearly defined limit on one or more performance metrics that the team agrees not to exceed and that is used to guide design and development. Um, it's a lengthy uh, definition. Apparently, I'm not, I'm a little long-winded, but I do feel like there's the three core parts here is like it has to be very clearly defined. It's important that the team does agree that they're not going to exceed it. And it has to be used to guide that design and development. If you don't have those three things happening, then it's not a budget. It's just a number. Um, on the surface, performance budgets are really simplistic. Uh, but in my experience working with a bunch of different organizations uh, at different points in their performance journey, uh, establishing a meaningful budget uh, is one of the most critical components in successfully changing the way that that company approaches performance on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Addy did a really good job of showing uh, some real world impact of a few companies that are doing that um, earlier in his talk. Um, although I have to say, I, maybe it's because of the trailer yesterday or whatever, but when I saw the hold the line, I immediately thought hold the door and hold or, and, and I'm, I, apparently I'm a little too one track mind right now. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very meaningful and important step and one of the first steps you should take. Now, anyone who's ever uh, set a budget on their spending tell, will tell you that setting a budget by itself, that doesn't accomplish anything. Um, you need to uh, take a few steps to make it effective. And in the case of a performance budget, that means making it concrete, meaningful, integrated, uh, and enforced. Um, so talking about concrete, often you'll hear companies or, or people throw out terms like, we want it to be lightning quick. We want to be as fast as possible. We want to be faster than the competition, which is a little better maybe than the other ones. Um, but all three of them, you know, phrases like this are great. They're fantastic goals, um, but they're too subject to interpretation and they leave a lot of wiggle room. So a performance budget needs to be specific and it needs to be a clearly defined metric, something like, you know, we're going to no more than two seconds to start render time at the 90th percentile on 3G networks. There is no wiggle room here. You're very specific about what it is that you're targeting. Um, the metric that you choose also has to be meaningful. Um, then the best case scenario, you're looking at real user data for this. Uh, this is a chart from Speed Curve showing uh, real user data uh, relating bounce rate to start render. And you can see there's a very clear tie here as the start render time gets Longer and longer, the bounce rate starts to go up dramatically. Um, in this case, for this organization, bounce rate was a business critical objective. Like this is one of the metrics that they monitor for to see how well the site is performing for them. So it made absolute sense to create a budget based on this start render time, um, because we knew if we improved it, we'd get a better experience for users, and we'd also improve the uh, actual effectiveness of the site for the organization. 
if you don't have access to, uh, to real user data, um, well, first off, try to get try to get it. Um, I feel like I firmly believe like having solid real user data is ground zero um, for uh, improving an organization's performance. You you know it, it, it's what tells you what's actually happening. You you need that. If for some reason you can't get access to it, then try to find some other meaningful way to establish that budget. Um, a competitive analysis can be really effective. Um, there's a tool called Web Page Test Mapper by Andy Davies that I love to fire up uh, inside of Google Spreadsheets that you can queue up a bunch of tests through Web Page Test um, and get the metrics back. Um, if you fire this up with 10 to 12 competitors and pick a meaningful like user-centric metric, um, and then find like the fastest one, like whether that's you or the competitors, whoever it is, find the fastest one and then aim for a little bit higher than that. Um, it can be a nice way to, to give you sort of a, a meaningful goal to go after. Um, but again, I, I, if you can, the real user data is where the, uh, the real goods are at. Um, once you have something meaningful established, then you wanna make sure that it's actually integrated. Uh, Addy showed some slides talking about like, where does performance fit in the workflow? And obviously, I think anybody here probably agrees it's it's the entire workflow, right? It has to be all the way in, baked in. Um, so that means take your budget and put it into acceptance criteria for any new feature or page. It means putting an ad inside of your developer environment so that when developers are making changes to the CSS or JavaScript or images, they're immediately getting feedback on how well they're adhering to that budget. Uh, it means taking that metric, um, whatever it is that you chose, and translating it to some sort of like bite size or, or you know resource limit, because this is a really tangible goal that developers or designers can look at um, in their day to day efforts. You know, it's tough to see necessarily. Oh, throwing that other image, what's that going to do for start render, or what's that going to do for document complete or whatever? But if I know that I've got X amount of kilobytes to play with, that puts some constraints there. Um, and then designers and developers can start getting creative and start to evaluate whether or not they want to use you know, the slightly heavier font or if they want to throw that extra image into place. Um, I've even seen companies go as far as putting the budgets into their SLAs with their third parties. The idea is you want to make the budget um, and how you stack up to it as visible as possible to everyone. If you can, throw it up on a dashboard. Uh, this is a speed curves dashboard view for the performance budgets uh, within you know, any given account that you have. Throw this up on screens throughout the office so that when people are walking by, they're immediately seeing how they're doing it and it's front of mind for everybody. Uh, once the budget is firmly integrated into your workflow, the next step is to make it enforceable. Um, people, for the most part, we're, we're pretty cool, um, but we're gonna drop the ball from time to time. And so uh, we're, we need something concrete that's gonna stop us um, the, from blowing past that budget. And that's why we need things that are enforced so that we don't ever get to the issue where things are a problem in production. Um, you know, most monitoring tools now let you establish budgets uh, that will alert team members via Slack or email or a similar format if that budget is exceeded. Um, it's a passive way of keeping tabs on the budget and it's post-production typically. Um, but it can clue you in very quickly when something goes wrong. Even better is being proactive and building checks and balances into your continuous integration environment or your build process. Um, Addy mentioned Lighthouse Bot. Uh, I'm really excited about Light Wallet, the performance budget stuff. I think that's gonna be really neat. Um, I don't necessarily think that you should um, have Lighthouse scores as your primary performance budget, but it's a really good way of enforcing that you're taking care of some um, critical performance tasks. If you're building any sort of JavaScript uh, heavy application or site, which nowadays many of us are, bundle size is an absolute must. Like have it automatically checking every pull request to make sure that you're within a certain threshold of your target size for those bundles. Um, and it enforces those hard limits and those hard limits can be really useful. There was a podcast, a uh, shop tech show that Jason Miller of Preact was on recently. And he was talking about like, they put this hard limit, like they weren't going to exceed three kilobytes um, and so any PR that introduced a new feature or a new functionality um, and new code, that same PR also had to optimize the heck out of something to counter the new code and the new functionality that was coming in. The idea being you were basically playing code golf, as Jason put it, um, trying to get to a point where you optimize the heck out of this other thing so that the weight would only get lighter with each PR, not heavier. Um, which is not exactly what we anticipate. We anticipate our code base growing and stuff over time, but having these hard limits on there can really force some sort of creativity. Um, the point is, is not to let the performance budget try to stand on its own, 
um, somewhere hidden in company documentation and vague terminology, you know, it's not just a number, it's a hard line. It's, it's a unifying target for teams that your entire team can rally around. And it provides clarity and it provides constraints that can help to guide those decisions throughout the entire workflow um, and enable teams to focus on making meaningful improvements to the performance of their site or application that are going to uh, provide a better experience while also impacting the bottom line. Uh, so this is a whirlwind tour. I know we'll have a little Q&A stuff that comes out, but um, there's fantastic resources already available all over the place around performance budgets. Um, I've written a lot of stuff. Um, some of my favorites out there, though, are from uh, Jessenia Perez-Cruz has an amazing talk that she gave about designing with a performance budget in place. Um, Addy wrote a fantastic post uh, late last year around performance budgeting. Uh, and Alex Russell had a great post as well uh, where he did, you know, looked at it as a real world performance budget. It's like, how do you, when you're factoring in real world networks and low end devices, um, you know, that long tail of devices, how do we then come up with a real performance budget that provides a good experience for those folks as well? So I highly recommend those. Um, oh, you can always bother me after as well. I'm always happy to talk about this kind of stuff. So thanks. Great. Well, that was uh, really informative and really useful for people that are setting those um, performance budgets. I'm curious about a potential fifth step in your process, which is um, your thoughts on evaluating your performance budget. So you set a performance budget, maybe you make a lot of effort to get there, maybe you do get there, and you're trying to decide whether to, you know, if you shaved a second or two off of your, you know, your metrics to get to your goal, whether to shave another second or two, whether that starts to be worth it. You know, how do you measure, what are your recommendations for how do you measure whether your, um, you know, your budget was effective or whether it should change in any direction? So I think I, I think that touches on a really good point, which is that the performance budget is also not static. Like um, it, you 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 have a starting point that you're playing with that you're putting out there um, to get you rolling and get you motivated and get you do work, doing some work. But then you're always seeking to adjust and tweak that performance budget as necessary. So uh, I, again, ideally, this is coming from that real user data. This is the only way you're going to know for sure, like what the impact is. Um, but have if you have something like impulse or speed curve, you know, that's showing you the correlation between your business metrics and your performance metrics, um, you can watch what happens as you get to that performance budget, as maybe you surpass that performance budget, you know, watch the impact on those business metrics and see what's happening. Um, and as you hit the performance budget, maybe you will find that it didn't have the impact you expected. But that's why you're always doing further analysis to find other, you know, metrics that maybe make sense to target. Um, more likely, you're going to see some impact. And so then you don't stand still. Um, hopefully, you use that as sort of a momentum builder. And you say, all right, we've got our performance budget at this point. We've hit it. We're seeing meaningful improvements. Let's shave 20% off and see what happens. And just keep going until you get to a point where there's no more like the diminishing returns kicks in. And suddenly, you're not seeing the benefit anymore. Um, it's important. We're not making stuff. Well, most of us aren't making stuff performant for the sake of being able to say that it's performant. We're making it performant because it provides a better experience and because it helps the business. Um, and as long as it keeps doing that, you know, keep changing it and altering it and bringing it down. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we will move on. So next we have uh, your Weiss, who's a, um, excuse me. Who, I just lost your name. I apologize. Uh, developer advocate at Google and also a WebPerf working group member. So uh, apologies for that. But whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Sure. Hi. Um, so everyone before me were super practical. I'm going to break away from that and talk a bit about some future proposals and some future technologies that we're working on under the umbrella of instant loading and let me try to share my screen um can you see my slides yep awesome um so um so hi uh i'm your advice i work for google i work on the web platform adding various uh, performance related features and when we talk about performance uh we can't really ignore amp um, AMP came, came to the public scene in 2015 and made a lot of noise in the performance community. And AMP does its thing um, 
by applying restrictions to what content can load on a page and by killing off a bunch of behaviors and a bu bunch of functionalities that mobile pages typically suffer from. But to a large extent, AMP make pages faster by cheating. Um, AMP cheats because by the time the user clicks on a link, uh, they the content that they were uh, the content that they're loading is mostly already there on the user's device ready to go. So uh, the page loading critical path is shifted in time to happen at a point where we just don't care as much. Uh, no user is staring at the screen in frustration when that happens. So cheating is great. And we need the web platform to be able to natively cheat, cheat in a similar way. Um, AMP is able to cheat by. Um, by modifying the URLs of pages and by serving them from trusted servers instead of from their original origin. And the reason it does that is that the user's privacy must be maintained and the origin must not know that the user has uh, searched for something until the user has actually clicked on the link and navigated to that page. Um, but modifying the URL is less than ideal. So. There's a good chunk of capabilities that we're missing from the platform to enable this, um, this functionality while still enabling us to keep URLs, the same origin policy, and everything else that makes the web the web. Um, so essentially, uh, the capability we're talking about is called uh, Privacy Preserving Prefetch in AMP. And that's a fancy way of saying that we're getting content to the user before they ask for it but without revealing that fact to the site's origin. Um, so how can the web support that kind of cheating? How can we load resources without letting the origin know that this actually happened, but at the same time still maintain the concept of origins on the web? Um, and origins on the web matter a whole lot because uh, they have a lot to determine uh, uh, when it comes to what data the resources on the web are allowed to access, which credentials they're getting, and to somewhat important extent, which URLs the user sees uh, in the URL bar. And from the beginning of the web, the concept of an origin was coupled with uh, the transport of the resource. In order for a resource to be considered uh, as coming from a certain origin, it had to be delivered from that physical host. Um, and when looking at secure origins on the web and the guarantees that TLS uh, gives us, it provides us with guarantees regarding the resources, authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality. Uh, that means that the resource was provided by a specific origin, wasn't modified in transit, and no one could read the contents while it was passing through the network which are all great guarantees. But if we look at a smaller subset of the problem and focused on non-credentialed resources, so resources that their content is not determined by cookies and otherwise are not uh, personalized or specific to some users but not others, uh, then we can see that just authenticity and integrity are enough. And um, for those uh, to be guaranteed, we don't really need the resource to be delivered from a physical origin that holds the private key uh, for that host. It's enough to have that original origin sign the resource, but then have then we can have the resource be physically delivered from anywhere on the internet, and we can still know that the content is authentic and wasn't modified. Um, so the proposal uh, to make that happen is sign exchanges. That's a standard proposal that basically enables us to perform that decoupling uh, by defining a way in which the server can sign the content or sign a digest of the content. And then the browser can verify that this content was indeed, indeed um, created by the original origin, regardless of where it came from. We also have bundled exchanges, which is a sibling proposal, which enables us to send down multiple resources as part of a single larger one, um, which will enable us to 
prefetch all those resources in, in a private way. Um, another reason I'm excited about that particular proposal is because I think it has the potential of improving the way that we deliver JavaScript as in ES modules uh, on the web today and basically replace JavaScript concatenation uh, that we use today without many of the trade-offs. Um, another key component here is link rel prefetch, um, which is supported on the web today in some browsers, but not all. Um, and in order for prefetch to be able to be implemented in all modern browsers, uh, we will probably need to modify it a little bit. Um, the way that prefetch works today is somewhat conflicting with Safari's double key caching model. Um, so we are uh, working on some proposals to improve that. And as part of that, it will likely mean that the cross origin prefetches will only be reserved for navigation requests and not work for sub resources. Um, so in order uh, for us to also be able to privately prefetch sub resources, or at least the ones that we cannot or don't want to bundle, uh, we have link rel preload, uh, which comes in handy in those cases. Um, in particular, uh, we can use the link header variant of preload in order to do that and add that to those prefetch requests um, to make sure that uh, those prefetch resources, um, they can bring along the required sub resources in that way. Um, <clears throat> one limitation of preload was that it's not currently suited uh, or it wasn't suited to um, to preload responsive images. We talked earlier about source set and sizes, um, but preload wasn't able to preload that kind of resources, um, which led us to add uh, image source set and image sizes attributes on the link element as well as on the link headers. Uh, which uh, mirror source set and sizes and now enable us to preload responsive images uh, just like other resources. And finally, um, in order to enable the, those kind of resources to, pre, to be preloaded um, at an earlier stage before the HTML actually arrived to the client, uh, we have a proposal in place to enable a viewport setting through a header um, which will mirror the current um, meta tag uh, methods of setting viewports. Um, and with that, um, that, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So that, that was some really exciting, um, some really exciting previews of stuff to come. You know, where, where is the best place for people to be paying attention to for when a lot of this stuff is usable or the best way is to plug into this or to take advantage of this? Um, other than your than your Twitter account, I'm sure. Is there any place particularly that people should be monitoring for this kind of stuff? Um, so all these proposals go through um, Blink, the Blink Dev mailing lists, as well as they're being worked on in GitHub in the various uh, standardization bodies. Um, they are. I believe most, if not all, are being incubated as part of the YCG, the Web Platform Incubation Community Group. Uh, so I guess that the discourse, uh, the YCG discourse, so discourse.ycg.org, uh, .io, sorry, uh, would be uh, the right pla place to keep track of general proposals uh, for this particular subject, um, yeah, it's um, yeah, YCG would be the the best place to keep track of that. Awesome, and I think I mentioned earlier on. I, I think I saw that you were a member of the WebPerf working group, and it's really cool that there are groups like that. Um, you know, paying attention to issues like that for people that are really interested in web performance. Is this something that they can monitor? Is this something that they can participate in, or something that people should want to participate in to kind of to, to learn or to give feedback? Um, definitely. Uh, so uh, we are. Um, so the, the web performance working group is like has traditionally been mostly composed of browser vendors, uh, but we've been um, 
trying to quote unquote recruit more um, developers and more industry participation uh, from um, interested uh, developers. Uh, so having developers join either uh, as uh, employees of W3C members or as uh, invited experts is definitely something that we're encouraging. Uh, all the minutes from the meetings are uh, published online. Um, we are starting to experiment with publishing videos of the meetings, which, um, to be honest, are not very different from this kind of setting where, uh, like, it's a Google Hangout. Uh, everything is minuted, so we, we go over the issues or talk about new features that are uh, being designed. And, yeah, the developers are more than welcome to join, and if anyone um, is interested in joining or interested in monitoring this work up more closely, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about that. Great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. That was great information. I really appreciate that. Uh, coming up next, we have Patrick Meenan, a web performance uh, engineer at Cloudflare, also the creator of web page tests. So um, Patrick, whenever you're ready. Sure. No, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see almost everyone uh, before me mention uh, like first content full paint and some of the the user experience metrics we've been uh, starting to migrate towards and I can't see page load time die soon enough um, I'm really excited to see that go away uh, that's for me that's probably the most exciting uh, change over the last few years was the the focus on user experience metrics instead of uh, technical browser metrics uh, first content full paint is still really early in the user experience life cycle. Uh, it's an awesome starting point. I'm looking forward to hero timing and some of the other uh, sort of richer, deeper uh, experience metrics coming to the field. Uh, but the more we can get people to optimize for those, uh, the happier I'll be, which of course makes everyone happy, right? Um, so I've uh, more recently been uh, focusing on just trying to make sort of the long tail of the web faster. Uh, look at a whole bunch of websites. What are the common issues that we're seeing with them? Uh, and what can we do to try and lift uh, as much of the deep tail of the web where maybe they don't have huge dev teams uh, to contribute to, to the site development? And uh, one of the first things um, I did was to, to try and make Google Fonts faster. It's used on like 50% of the websites. Uh, and it's all coming from an external uh, domain. And I did all this work to, to collapse it onto the, the same origin as the site and proxy and inline the CSS and do a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, the waterfall looked great. And then at the end of the day, it was slower, um, which is just you know not exactly what you want to see. Uh, and it turned out. Um, that when you do all of the right things, there's still a lot of technology under you that has to be working right for your, your content to actually work the way you expected it to. And what we were seeing is uh, even though, so at Cloudflare, uh, largely use an Nginx-based uh, stack, uh, and HTTP2 uh, is supported in Ng Nginx as a full, uh, including priorities and everything else. But it wasn't actually working. Um, and it turns out uh, network buffering was a fairly big problem, and it was completely defeating uh, the, the server implementation of uh, resource prioritization. So the servers were sending resources back willy-nilly in sort of what, whatever order they happened to get them. Uh, and so that was the first sort of big win we had was to you know actually get the deployment of HTTP2 working uh, to spec uh, to what the browser was requesting. And it's it's a little scary when you sort of start peeling back these layers of the onions. Uh, we've I've been working with Andy Davies on a test um, so that everyone can sort of test their own deployment and uh, tracking uh, what it looks like out in the wild. And so if you go to is HTTP too fast yet? Um, we've got a tracker that's sort of tracking what does the deployments actually look like in the wild and Today, for really large uh, CDNs and hosting providers, it's easier to say how many work than don't work, just because there are so many deployments that are actually broken. So everything we've been hearing up to date, uh, guest.js, uh, preload, prefetch, uh, module splitting, 
all of this depends on you actually being able to say, hey, these low priority resources, load them later after this critical stuff. Uh, and you're sort of expecting the browser will honor what you're trying to do, and then the servers you're connecting to will honor what you're trying to do. Uh, and it turns out in practice, that's not the case. Um, so please, everyone, uh, let's try and get as much pressure as possible to fix it. Unfortunately, it's not one of those sort of checkbox items where, uh, yes, I'm using Nginx. It supports HTTP2. It'll just magically work. Uh, there's a lot of deployment uh, issues that need to be sorted out uh, to actually get it to work in practice. Uh, so more pressure we can apply, uh, more visibility, the better. Hopefully, we can get prioritization actually working. Uh, so prefetch and preload and everything works the way we want it to. Um, I will caution, uh, a lot of us use Chrome uh, regularly for our, our development and our testing. Uh, Chrome has uh, sort of one of the, the deeper implementations for resource prioritization and scheduling. Uh, Firefox has a pretty good uh, strategy. It's very different, though. Uh, and uh, Safari has almost no prioritization. So everything kind of comes in scattershot. Uh, you request your JS, your CSS, uh, your images. They get a little bit of weight applied to them, but they all download concurrently. So when you're testing your, your loading schemes, we need to be really good about testing in all of the browsers on the low speed connections, but in the actual browser, not just faking the user agent string, not just sort of faking uh, the experience. It needs to be the real experience, uh, which sort of brings us to um, the, the network emulation. Uh, for this kind of problem, you can't use Chrome DevTools network emulation uh, because the layer, the layer that it works at uh, is high enough that it doesn't actually see the protocol level uh, issues. Uh, so it's more complicated, but if, if you're on a Mac, uh, the network link conditioner, something that works at the packet level uh, when you're doing your testing is absolutely critical to being able to see any of these. Um, so unfortunately, I'm sort of been tilting at that windmill. That's my current windmill to tilt at because I think the, the impact is going to be huge. Um, and sort of the, 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 nec the next uh, area I've been sort of working on is, OK, we can get the protocol sorted out. Let's see what I can do to sort of rewrite a whole bunch of these sites and, and what optimizations can I do? What can I move around to make things faster? And the red line is uh, lower is better. The middle is uh, even. It doesn't get any faster. It doesn't get any slower. And a left to right is percentile. So the lower the, the, the line is basically the faster things got. Uh, the red line is I threw a whole bunch of optimizations at sites, uh, ran it through uh, roughly 1,000 e-commerce sites. And you know I got a, a little bit of a gain. So I was seeing maybe 10% on the median. Some sites got slower. I need to look at those. Uh, but then you know this, this one trick, right? Um, edge caching the HTML. Uh, like 90% of the sites got faster. Uh, half of the sites got 25% faster on a desktop connection. And, and this is one of those things where on faster connections, the impact is actually uh, even more uh, just because it's so much dominated by the, the first byte time. So we've got sort of the, the serious hosting performance problem, if you would, where, where the long tail of sites are hosted on shared platforms on WordPress with slow databases. And they actually take uh, on orders of our performance budget just to generate the HTML before the browser even tries to load anything else. And I'm not sure entirely how we solve that problem other than throwing some caching at it. Um, I don't know that we can go out and make all of the hosting providers uh, throw more uh, money at hardware, uh, but getting more visibility into that and trying to find ways to solve it is sort of one of the other areas I'm focused fairly strongly on. Um, and sort of the the last thing I'm uh, kind of really excited about, and it's it's sort of uh, plugging another finger in the dike that's leaking, uh, and that dike being all the JS that devs are throwing on sites. Um, we, we shuffle things around, we package it, we cut it up, we try and move things around as much as possible. Uh, the next thing that I see coming down the pike on that is uh, the bin AST proposal that uh, Facebook Mozilla and we're helping out with is where we actually 
it's not quite compiled, but you you almost pre-parse the Java the text JavaScript on the server, and you send down uh, the JavaScript in a binary format that's much easier for the browser to parse. So instead of like a millisecond for every k of JavaScript uh, for just parsing and reading the text, now it's a binary format that can almost almost be parsed instantly because it knows where the offsets are for functions and what it needs to compile. And so this will buy us a little more time in the in the dike of leaking JavaScript. Um, I'm I'm afraid what it'll actually do is it just sort of give people more budget to throw more JavaScript at sites. I was a little uh, freaked out when uh, Katie uh, tweeted out just yesterday. I think the the percentile distributions from uh, the JavaScript sizes for the HTTP archive from the the four million sites from the Chrome user experience report and the 90th percentile, which is still 400,000 sites that get a whole lot of traffic, uh, was still 1.2 megs of compressed JavaScript, which is you know on the orders of five megabytes plus uncompressed. That's five seconds of parse time uh, plus on some of these lower end devices, uh, which is just insane. Uh, we can we can help. Um, but you know, <laughs> the more we can encourage uh, devs, I'd love to see us. Uh, I've got. React sites that I'm responsible for that are marketing pages that are completely static that have no business being a React page. Um, it, it's maybe it's a, an easier developer experience to put it together that way. Uh, maybe it's a good way to build my dev skills uh, for finding my next job, uh, so I can say React on my resume. Um, but being able to say no and figuring out how we do more, uh, I love what Zach's doing with Eleventy. Uh, where he's uh, basically doing a static site generator, uh, where you have all the fancy work on and the build system on the back end, uh, but what actually goes down to the browser is compiled HTML. Uh, you know, browsers love that. If you've got a static marketing page, that's really all it needs to be. Uh, if you've got a, a CMS that's uh, building static pages for people. Uh, I'd love to see us try and keep all of the fancy dev work and the logic on the back end on the publishing tools, uh, but still produce nice, simple rendered pages to the client. Uh, for me, that's that's largely uh, sort of what I've been excited about and sort of the areas I've been poking at. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, there were some really exciting and interesting approaches there. Some of them, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but seem like sort of uh, ambitious ones or maybe more advanced features. So if there's people watching that are maybe part of a small team or a slightly less sophisticated um, organization as far as performance, they're just sort of getting into this, is there one key takeaway for them from some of the things that you showed that maybe would sort of uh, to do kind of right by some of the things that they should do first? I guess, I mean, for me, the, the fundamentals uh, really just get down to uh, know how to look at a waterfall in a film strip and understand everything that's going on in it and make sure it's actually working the way you expect it to. Uh, no matter what you're building, that's sort of the fundamental of, yeah, I thought I built something and it's not working the way I expected it to. Uh, and then that leads you down sort of all of the alleys of uh, what do I need to optimize for for the user experience? Uh, what's not working the way I expected it to? Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll move on to our final, but certainly not least, speaker of the day. Uh, Tatiana Mack is an inclusive and accessible designer and editor for Alyssa Part and a teacher at Skillshare. So Tatiana, whenever you're ready, feel free. Take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to go last, despite all the technical difficulties this morning, because I feel like what I have to say um, touches on what everything everyone else has already said um, and, and builds upon that. We've seen clearly here today a really technical focus, which I think is really great. Um, it's within the performance space. Um, but I want us to step back a little bit. Uh, I, as many of you may have seen recently, the web aim report of the Majestic Million site. Um, if you haven't effectively web aim crawled all of the, the most popular sites on the internet and showed effectively how accessible, or spoiler alert in this case, inaccessible they all were. Um, and some of the findings are super fascinating. And beyond the niche world of accessibility, I think what's relevant uh, out here today was specifically I was looking through the um, JavaScript frameworks that were being used 
and seeing um, how for most of the frameworks we're used to using, they're on the upwards of 60 to 65 errors from an accessibility standpoint. And that is not good. Um, I think that what I would love to see and my mind the state of performance that we need to do next is to find how to intersect the challenges we have in the accessibility space which i feel very comfortable um, established in with the performance space which i very much feel new um, and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in but we have a lot of the same goals um, if something is not accessible to everyone it's not usable. So if it's it's not even rendering for them, how can it be performant? Um, and thinking through the lens of security, right? Like if we are ensuring we're only accessing uh, the very minimal amount of data or um, touch points from the user, that's calling fewer third party um, needs, which can be very heavy as we all know, especially in the realm of, of ads. Um, so I really want us to think you know, in that space of how can we, in the accessibility and performance space, work together more in order to help um, make all of these things we're talking about today more accessible, um, not only for our products to be more accessible, but how do we make this conversation more accessible? I think if we're looking at everyone on the call today, um, we have supremely talented engineers. I'm a designer um, by trade first, and. Um, when I hear these things, uh, I start thinking about, you know, I think someone brought up images. That's great. Um, I start thinking about how uh, designers especially are guilty of wanting uh, images to look very crisp, right? Like we don't want our images to look rasterized. Uh, so how do we ensure uh, that from a c compression standpoint, things that we care so much about are not being compressed to a point where they're no longer carrying the message? Um, and I think about videos. So a videographer works tremendously hard to get the lighting right, but a fallback that we often rely on um, for a video background image, right, is compressing it all the way down to a GIF. That's losing a lot of the fidelity that you have. So how can we start to get more people thinking about performance so that they can tailor their crafts um, and making sure that performance doesn't fall on the weight of just the engineers on the team? That's what I, I keep seeing is that uh, performance and accessibility are thought to be these black boxes. Like you send your website into this land of, of accessibility um, testing or, or performance testing, and then it comes out uh, this like new magical thing. We all know that's not how it happens, but I think that's the perception outside of this group of people. Uh, so I think what we need to do is to find ways to open up the gates and to make performance more accessible to our teams. Uh, understanding for a UX designer, how are the how are the pieces of research that you're doing? Um, are you considering performance in the questions that you're asking of your users? Um, like the videographer example I just gave. Um, I think all of this to say that um, I'd love to see performance be more of a mindset. Um, I've been doing a lot of research as a beginner in this space. And so many of the beginner articles teach me how to use the relevant tools. And that's great. Um, but if I don't have a holistic understanding of how performance impacts our users, it doesn't really matter if I learn how to use the tools um, because it's kind of like this, what I was thinking about is uh, so often we use a sports car to drive down the block. And that's not the most accessible solution. It's not the most performant solution. Uh, so why? Why do we do it? Why do, um, I just looked up this report, 95.1% of websites use JavaScript. Why? Why, why do 95.1% of websites need it? Is it because of the features that we're presenting and, and our users need JavaScript in order to access them? Or is it somehow tethered with the fact that React developers are the highest paid developers right now in the industry? So these are some of the questions that I'm starting to ask in the space um, that I'm in. And I, I would love to see us start from a point of progressive enhancement. I know we talk about this a lot. Um, I love to see that uh, uh, progressive web apps are starting to become trendy. Um, I think that that's a huge challenge we have in this industry is that uh, React is not to pick on React. I think it's very beneficial when it's used appropriately. Um, but 
React is very trendy right now, so people are building um, sites in React when that's really not necessary. HTML and CSS could could be all that they need for that particular purpose. Um, so in my mind, in order to make things the most performant, we need to be asking these questions earlier. We need to make our teams more aware of the relevance of performance, not only to them in their disciplines, but also to the users that we're touching. Um, and I think we need to, to make this a more dis like anti-disciplinary conversation. Awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate that message. I love it a lot because we had this conversation on a different um, uh, recently, which was to users, performance is just how, in some ways, is how quickly they can start an, a task and complete a task. And so it feels like there is a lot of room to pull in a lot of different people other than just coders to reduce friction from certain paths through the code base, to not require as much information, to obviously make the sites more accessible so people aren't frustrated while they're on it. Um, I think this is a type of performance that I think people maybe don't evaluate nearly enough. Um, are there any other examples that you can think of where either um, you know designers or anybody else uh, can really make impact on the perceived performance of an application that, that people maybe can poke other people on their team to start looking at? Yeah, um, I think that thinking about um, designers, we have the same ego problem where we want to make things uh, as beautiful and as engaging as possible. I just saw on Twitter the other day, again, not to pick on this site, but there was a new site that launched and was getting loads of praise uh, because it was really dynamic and visually stunning. And a lot of the comments were to the effect of like, um, you know, the, screw your your computer fan. Like it's going to make all your computer fans run as a point of pride. And I think that that's <laughs> so sad to me because uh, these are people probably on the latest generation of tools, um, and they're they're bragging about the site is so great, and that uh, the fact that the fans are running are somehow uh, successful. So I think that as designers, especially, we need to get away from this idea of designing for ourselves. Um, we talk so much about user-centric design, but we don't really practice it. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's kind of a falsehood that we perpetuate. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, uh, thank you to all our presenters today. I think we have a little bit of time left to just kind of give people um, 30 to 60 seconds, you know, just to respond to any of the things that have been said or anything you forgot to mention in your presentation, or if you want to, you know, pitch what your, your Twitter handle is or something like that, uh, you can do that. We'll just run down the list in the same order that we uh, started with. So, Addy, did you want to uh, conclude with anything particular? Use a perf budget, ship less JavaScript. <laughs> Short and sweet. I love it. Uh, I think Harold had to step away. So, uh, Leo. Oop, you're muted, Leo. OK, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I will just follow up with what Adi said, um, focusing on uh, real user measurements and uh, start measuring not only in US, but also across all around the world. And uh, feel free to use Perfume.js and drop some feedback. Awesome. Minko, got any final thoughts for us? Sure, yeah, focus. Don't focus too much on. Micro optimizations focus on things which can have significant impact on your performance, such as code splitting and compression. Great. And Cornell. Uh, measure your bottlenecks and watch what's sent down the wire, because uh, it's not fast if it's not in the user's browser. There you go. Perfect. Tim? Oh, Tim. I don't know. Tim's still here. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still, I haven't gone anywhere yet. No, <laughs> no, I just to sort of reiterate, I think what Tatiana was saying was like, that's, that is it. Like focus on the entire journey. Like it is about the user. That's the natural like progression of things. You folk, like we don't make things faster because we want to make them faster. We make it faster because it's a better user experience. And if we put our focus there, you're eventually going to get to where you need to be. Awesome. Thanks. And Yov? Um, Again, since uh, everyone before me said all the practical stuff, uh, get into standards and determine the future of the platform, because it's our platform. Great. No, that's a great, that's a great one. And uh, Patrick. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, everyone's been covering it really well. But if you get the chance, uh, go look up John Rouser's talk uh, uh, from Velocity, look at your data. Uh, for me, that's sort of the, the best way uh, to represent sort of what I care about most is uh, look at the long tail, look at the outliers, look at the waterfalls. That's where the interesting stuff happens. And that's where you're going to find sort of all of the really edge case things. And the, the more you know your data and what it's supposed to look like, the more it'll help you sort of track down uh, when it's going wrong. Awesome. And then Tatiana, why don't you uh, have the final word? Love getting the last word. Uh, I so rarely do. <laughs> um, I would say that um, think of performance as a strategy to success and a mechanism by which we can center our most marginalized um, user. Because if we do that, then we are going to make the experience better for all of our users. Great. That's a great sentiment to end on and I uh, really appreciate everybody being here for this state first state of performance. Don't worry, this will not be the last conversation that we'll have about performance. So if there's anybody that was not on this panel that you'd like to see in future discussions, please reach out to us and let us know that. Um, we'd be happy to set up those conversations. Again, just thank everybody for being here, giving us their time and for all of you that are watching for being here as well. Um, for anybody that's curious, the slides, the links that people mentioned, the tools, we'll make sure that we accumulate all of that and we'll either we'll put it into the show notes so that people can have access to that. So anything that you missed, don't worry. Um, you know, you'll be able to rewind this if you want to go back and find it, but we'll also accumulate all those links together. Um, and the conversation doesn't have to stop here. So for any of the panelists, please reach out to them and, and talk to them about the things that resonated with you, ask questions, get involved. That's obviously great. And one more thing that we definitely want to note is that I think almost the majority of our panelists are going to be at the Perf Matters conference coming up in a few weeks. So if you did not get enough of discussion about performance and you want to see more of these people and more of other amazing people talk about performance, uh, definitely make sure that you check out the Perf Matters conference, which is coming up. So again, thank you everybody for being here um, and uh, have a great day.